Dr. Richard Schultz, who will, is a professor of psychiatry and the director of the uh, University Center for Sur uh, Social and Urban Research. He's also the director of gerontology and associate director of the Aging Institute uh, there. And I, finally, one of the few people I've met who has more titles than I do in uh, administrative abilities. His uh, career has focused on social, uh, social psychological effects and the impact of disabling late life diseases on patients and their families. He's obviously a leading contributor to the, uh, to the community and to the research field on the uh, health effects caregive, of caregiving and a special focus on caregivers of persons with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, he has uh, impressively authored over 280 publications, including in some of the highest impact journals in the field, such as the New England uh, Journal of Medicine. And he's a recent recipient of the uh, Klemeyer Award for Research on Aging from the Gerontological Society of America and the Developmental Health Award for Research on Health and Later Life from the American Psychological Association. So let's welcome Dr. Schultz. Thank you. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I feel doubly honored to be here today. I had the privilege of speaking to this group maybe four or five years ago, so uh, this is the second time I've been part of this meeting, uh, which I've enjoyed uh, both times. And uh, I also noticed that I'm the only speaker from outside of California uh, today. And uh, however, after hearing uh, Laura's talk uh, the last hour, I've decided to uh, move to Southern California <laughs> and, and beg her to be my doctor. <laughs> okay, uh, just a couple of disclosures. Uh, virtually everything we've done has been supported by the National Institutes of Health and Alzheimer's Association. Uh, we have received funds from pharmaceutical uh, companies to do some data analysis on some, some of these uh, NIH projects. Uh, a brief overview, I'm going to talk a little bit about the prevalence. We've talked a lot about caregivers and caregiving throughout the day, uh, but I'll hone in on some uh, key aspects of the caregiving experience that are important uh, to the Alzheimer's community but to the, and to the nation as a whole. Uh, talk quite a bit about intervention strategies and report to you the results of one of the largest trials that's ever been done to try and help Alzheimer's caregivers and uh, conclude with some observations about emerging technologies and how that might help uh, with respect to caring for persons with dementia. So most of you are probably familiar with uh, the basic data. There are millions and millions of caregivers in the United States, uh, over 65 million in any, any given year, and most of those caregivers are providing care to an older individual, although there's also caregiving in other realms of life as well. Um, we have lots of persons uh, with AD in this country, over five million. Uh, it's estimated that there are 15 million individuals, family members and friends involved in their care. They provide about 17 billion hours of care a year. And if you would try to pay for this conservatively, it would cost you over $200 billion a year. So that's $200 billion worth of free services that caregivers provide, which is more than we currently spend on uh, uh, formal services uh, for persons with AD. There is, of course, a lot of emotional uh, stress associated with caregiving, particularly AD caregiving, and uh, often high levels of uh, depression. Now, when I think about caregiving, I think of it as a, di as a dynamic process as illustrated here. Uh, you know, it doesn't, it's not something that happens overnight. It's something you phase into very gradually, and very often it begins when the uh, patient has IADL problems, which over time uh, evolve into serious ADL problems, and ultimately what happens is that uh, the individual is either placed or uh, dies. And uh, in trying to understand the caregiving experience, I think it's important to look at this whole process from beginning to end, and I'll show you what we learn when we do that. Now, along the way, there are a lot of questions you can ask. You could ask questions about uh, the psychological appraisal that caregivers make as they move through these various stages, what the health effects are on the caregiver, and finally, maybe most important, what can you do about it? How can you help them? And uh, that's what I'll focus on today. 
Well, very quickly, um, we've done a lot of work on uh, uh, following people as they move into and out of the caregiving role, and that's one of the most compelling ways to demonstrate what the effects of caregiving really are. And we make this distinction between sort of moderate uh, duty versus heavy duty caregiving, which typically involves ADL types of assistance being provided. And uh, what you see, as you see here, for example, if you look at something like depression, it increases uh, significantly as a person, as a caregiver moves from a moderate or non-caregiving state to this heavy duty caregiving state. Uh, and you can look at lots of different data. Uh, here we're looking at health risk behaviors. How well are they caring for themselves? And uh, you see it's that when you become a heavy caregiver, uh, not taking care of yourself becomes more prominent, more prevalent. Uh, and as you might expect, this leads to problems down the road. Uh, if you look at uh, prevalent disease count, and this is in a large epidemiologic study, uh, you look at um, these kinds of uh, prevalent disease counts over time by type of transition group, you see that being a heavy duty caregiver uh, entails high costs with respect to the occurrence uh, of increased chronic disease in the person providing care. Uh, and this applies uh, particularly to older spousal caregivers who are vulnerable to begin with. And finally, in a study we published now over 10 years ago, we showed, if you look at that last column, that uh, caregiving strain, being a strained caregiver, controlling for lots of other things, increases the likelihood of death by 63%. Uh, so uh, this takes you from a demonstration that caregiving not only affects things like stress and uh, uh, psychological well-being, it also has physical health consequences which uh, can be substantial. And here's a list of some of the things that uh, have been reported in the literature by us and others. So, as you follow this progression from the initiation to the expansion of the caregiving role, uh, in the early stages what you see is relatively benign, uh, minor problems with respect to uh, uh, what its impact on caregiving. And you might even argue that there are a lot of positives at that stage of the experience because caregivers are feeling that they're being effective, that they're making a difference in another person's life, uh, and there are a lot of positives to be taken out of that. Uh, a lot of that gets eroded as time uh, progresses and uh, caregiving becomes more futile and this is when you begin to see uh, these negative health effects. It's also instructive to see what happens when caregivers move out of the caregiving role either because the person is placed in a long-term care facility or the person dies and I think you'd be somewhat surprised to see what the data show Here's one example. This is the, these are the effects of placement. Uh, zero represents the point at which the person is placed. And if you follow things like depression and anxiety over time, there's absolutely no benefit associated, no benefit to the caregiver of placing their relative in a long-term care facility uh, uh, on indicators like uh, depression and anxiety. Of course, part of that is because they very often remain involved in the person's care. They visit. Uh, they get involved in helping to feed, dress, and bathe the patient when they visit, and so on. So the caregiving role often doesn't end. In a study that we're just now finishing up, looking at caregivers of uh, dementia patients um, in long-term care facilities and following them for a relatively long period of time, we see similar patterns. Very little, some drop in, with respect to burden, anxiety, and depression, but not a whole lot. Uh, as you might expect, given that, uh, at least on the face of it, it appears that they've relinquished most of their caregiving responsibilities. In contrast, uh, and, and this is taken from a uh, large dementia sample, uh, look at what happens to depression in caregivers after their loved one dies. The zero point is the point of death, and what you see is a, an initial uh, spike in uh, depressive symptoms, which is very short-lived, and within 20 to 30 weeks after the death, uh, these individuals are operating at levels that's very near normal levels of depressive symptomatology in, in uh, older populations. Uh, so incredible recovery, really, uh, attributed in this case to the death of the person with AD, and you might 
ask, you know, why or how could this happen? And reasons are, uh, I think, pretty obvious. The caregiver has the opportunity to become prepared for the care recipient's death. Uh, they've rehearsed it. They've uh, maybe done things pragmatically to get ready for it. Um, if you look at the bottom data, uh, they report that death was a relief to the care recipient. 77% reported that. And they even say in the middle that death was a relief to themselves. 44% uh, say somewhat and 28% um, say, or 27% say very much. Uh, so really uh, the death uh, paradoxically uh, turns out to be a positive event, particularly in the case of uh, Alzheimer's caregiving. So we can fill in the rest of this matrix and see that uh, uh, the process unfolds uh, to include lots of uh, distress, uh, psychiatric, physical morbidity, and even death in the middle stages, uh, recovery after the death of the patient, and continued distress for the most part when the person is placed in a long-term care facility. And you can look at uh, for signs of, of stress, and there are many of them. I'm not gonna go over them, but both physical and psychological signs of, of stress in the caregiver uh, that can be uh, guides to uh, intervention. However, there's a, very in there's a very easy way you can find out if a caregiver is uh, experiencing stress, and that is to ask them, are you experiencing stress because of the caregiving? <laughs> uh, that turns out to be highly predictive, and surprising, you may be surprised to find that about 30, in, uh, in epi studies, about 30% of the population says, no, I'm not, it's not a problem, I like what I'm doing, it's not an issue, I don't need help. Uh, so it isn't everybody that experiences the stress, but uh, finding out who does uh, is very, turns out to be very easy. So we understand the problem, but what can we do about it? And uh, the first thing you want to do is think about who's at risk. There's a lot of variability in caregivers out there. Uh, some do better than others, obviously, and you'd like to know who needs help most and who might benefit most. And uh, here are some of the risk factors, providing high levels of care, being poor, living with the care recipient is a risk factor. Uh, these are all risk factors for negative outcomes. Uh, being older, being, having less education, being female, uh, having no choice in taking on the caregiving role. And here again, this is an interesting variable that we recently explored. About half the population feels they have no choice in taking on the caregiving role. And to the extent that you feel that, you do worse and you're much more susceptible to uh, the potential for abuse in that situation. Uh, other risk factors that you can look for are uh, safety issues, uh, high levels of depression and anxiety, impaired self-care, low levels of social support, and problem behaviors, particularly in the case of AD caregiving. Uh, the presence of any or all of these things uh, portend poorly for the person who experiences them. Well, <clears throat> let me tell you about one, an intervention study that we recently completed called REACH. It's called Resources for Enhancing Alzheimer's Caregivers' Health. And this is the largest, to my knowledge, the largest intervention trial that's been ever, ever been done. Uh, it involved uh, many cities around the country, including some in California. And uh, it played out in two phases. There's a development phase and a uh, randomized trial testing phase and uh, involved overall over 1,800 patients and caregivers that were enrolled in these various cities. The strategy of REACH, and I think it's a strategy that's relevant to anybody who wants to help a caregiver, is to first recognize this variability in risk at, at the individual level. And uh, so the first thing we did is we, and there, we developed and applied um, a risk appraisal strategy that helped us identify in what areas an individual needed help most. Then we adjust the dosing uh, based on that risk appraisal and, of course, assessed outcomes linked to the risks that we addressed in the intervention. And um, our intervention overall addressed six areas, burden, problem behavior, social support, social integration, all things you've heard about today. 
uh, self-care and physical health of the caregiver, emotional well-being, and for everybody, we had, for ethical reasons, we had to address uh, safety issues. Uh, so that risk appraisal uh, identified the level of risk you had in each of these areas, and then the dosing or the intervention for that risk area was adjusted to your particular level of need. And just to give you an example of the kinds of um, strategies we used, so for something like uh, safety, we would look for things like driving access to weapons, medications, and household obstacles, and uh, do a home assessment, alterations, remove, uh, change behaviors, or remove things that needed to be removed, and uh, we, we could look at outcomes related to that kind of intervention. Uh, for self-care and preventive health behaviors in the care, caregiver, uh, we developed this health passport, uh, we gave them some education, monitoring, facilitated access to resources they needed, and then of course looked for indicators of improved self-care, health behaviors, and better health uh, in the caregiver. Uh, for social support, uh, we provided information referral sources, support groups. Uh, for depression, we uh, did some relaxation and ple pleasant events training. Uh, and so on. Uh, that gives you sort of an overview of uh, the strategies that were used in multiple different categories. But let me drill down a little bit now and talk about uh, how to deal with a specific uh, problem. And this is um, the example I'm going to use is com combativeness. Uh, so here the issue is the problem behavior that's been identified by the caregiver is combat combative combativeness. And uh, the question is, what can we do about it, or how should we try to deal with this? So this is what's delivered to the uh, caregiver. First of all, there's some education about what combativeness is all about, uh, as illustrated here. Uh, giving them some reasons, some understanding of why uh, a, a dementia patient may become combative, uh, and having them look for those indicators in their life situations. Uh, keeping, uh, teaching them how to keep the patient calm, uh, taking steps to prevent frustration in the patient, and uh, you know, doing things like uh, being reasonable, uh, changing our expectations if necessary, uh, avoid uh, places of loud noise or too much activity, things you've heard again uh, in other examples today. Uh, getting rest, um, plan stressful activities uh, typically early in the morning when the, when the patient has energy. Um, Again, uh, doing things like um, having the patient get exercise, taking walks with them, uh, having, if they fail to complete tasks, don't press, uh, establish routines and stick to them, uh, limit the number of choices if they need to uh, dress themselves, uh, have difficult, they often have difficult making uh, choices uh, between four and five things, but when you reduce it down to two, it's a much more manageable task. Um, Communicating calmly in a variety of ways uh, with the patient, uh, speaking slowly, for example, example uh, don't arguing with the patient, uh, don't be critical, uh, keep frustrations from getting out of hand, uh, watch for signs of frustration both in yourself and the patient. Uh, if the patient becomes upset while trying to finish a task, try another task, switch to something else. If the patient becomes upset while putting on uh, shoes or socks, uh, take a break, do something else, then return to it. So these are uh, what we call uh, behavioral prescriptions that provide very detailed and very concrete guidance about how to deal with a specific problem. And there are about, I'm guessing, 30 of these uh, broken down in this level of detail. And it goes on and on, I'm not gonna uh, list them all, uh, but uh, this kind of activity or this kind of direction is what we find is uh, probably most effective in helping caregivers deal with the biggest challenges uh, they face in AD caregiving. And uh, the, an important element of this is not just keeping it at a didactic level, that is delivering the information and then getting, collecting some evidence uh, based on the performance of the caregiver that they understand what that information is and can actually execute 
uh, the things that you want them to do. So it's not just uh, them absorbing this stuff, it's them demonstrating that they can enact it. And that's a critical element in, in making this succeed. In general, uh, the more you engage the caregiver in this enactment process, in the doing of things, as opposed to listening to you about what they should do, uh, the better off they are and the more they learn. We had um, earlier, uh, early on in this uh, intervention trial, we were trying various things, and our original vision was that we were gonna teach these caregivers sort of cognitive behavior analytic skills. They we're gonna teach them so well that they can analyze the situation and figure out why a caregiver becomes uh, combative on their own uh, if that's the problem they're interested in. Uh, but I have to tell you that pretty much failed, either because uh, we, uh, we didn't spend enough time with them uh, or because the, that task turns out to be pretty challenging, uh, but uh, that did not work. So the fallback position was to be much more explicit on what needs to be done, uh, tell them how to do it, uh, and then see if they can do it. And once we did that, uh, things worked reasonably well. Um, you know, I want to come back to a point that was made earlier in the morning. Uh, there is a, a caveat or component to all of these instructions, which is uh, which has to do with contacting the patient's doctor. Uh, you know, if the patient seems ill or in pain. Uh, if they have hearing or vision problems that making, that's making things work to see, uh, and as we heard early this morning, if the patient's medicines could be causing the problem, that's obviously a reason to uh, contact a physician and see what they can do with respect uh, to those uh, particular issues. Um, I'm gonna skip that for a second. So. What did we learn? So we ran this trial. Uh, it was six months. We had, in each condition in the uh, randomized trial, there were, uh, about 640 individuals part, uh, participated. Uh, they were evenly split among Hispanics, whites, and blacks. So we had roughly 200 in each of those uh, racial ethnic ca categories. And this is a summary indicator of uh, what the outcome was. And uh, it, it's a composite that's essentially a clinic, an indicator of clinically significant improvement across these five domains that we were interested in, depression, support, self-care, burden, problem behaviors, by treatment group, and by race and ethnicity. And what you can see here is that the intervention group did much better than the control group in all of the three racial ethnic groups. Uh, but what was, what was particularly impressive is the extent to which it impacted Hispanic patients or uh, caregivers. Uh, they clearly benefited more than the other two groups. <clears throat> and I should tell you that we, the intervention and the assessments for Hispanics were delivered in Spanish. Uh, and um, we think that the, the reason they did so much better is that this was a relative deprivation phenomenon, that these people had relatively little access uh, and knowledge about what they were dealing with, and so what we had to offer meant a lot to them, and uh, therefore they benefited more uh, than the other racial ethnic groups. Uh, among blacks, we had this interesting phenomenon that um, Wives of patients benefited much more than adult children who were caring for an AD uh, relative. And in fact, there was no benefit for uh, black adult children caring for a parent. Uh, the effect, the positive effect came entirely from wives caring for, uh, husbands and wives caring for their spouse. Okay. Um, just a plug for ourselves. When we published the results of this study, they also published a, um, an editorial along with it. This was in the Annals of Internal Medicine uh, where uh, Kevin Kavinsky and Johnson, who are Californians, by the way, so they have to be credible, uh, <laughs> thought that this was really a great intervention. 
Uh, okay, so let me tell you a little bit what's happened since REACH was first uh, implemented. It's really taken off uh, nationally in, in a number of arenas. There's a major, uh, there's a paper that came out uh, about a year ago that Linda Nichols did, who was one of the original REACH investigators, which was a translation of REACH into the Re REACH VA. So it's a dissemination kind of study where they were looking to uh, implement it as part of the um, uh, VA home care program for dementia patients. And uh, she had terrific success, even better success uh, than we had in the original REACH trial and uh, got all kinds of uh, nice outcomes in many of these areas. So uh, it's also been adopted by a lot of state agencies around the country and is being replicated uh, by um, people in Hong Kong, mainland China, and Korea. Now one of the things that we didn't think of uh, that I wish we had is that uh, the people in China have decided to uh, sort of copyright the intervention <laughs> so they charge people to train them how to train them how to deliver it, and are par apparently making quite a bit of money doing this. Um, so, <clears throat> but uh, from a practical point of view, I mean it's it's good that's being disseminated widely, and, and hopefully it's having impact in other areas of the world as well. Okay, uh, I'm going to switch uh, finally to uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, technology. And, you know, if you walk the aisles out there, you saw some examples of um, sort of emerging technologies to help caregivers and patients. Uh, my focus, of course, is on caregivers. And, you know, the, the old traditional model of technology um, for people with disabilities is illustrated here. Uh, you know, these are very traditional kinds of assistive technologies that have been around for a long time. And you can actually go to a website uh, that gives you information about specific assistive devices that are available for um, dementia caregivers, as well as dementia patients. Uh, however, there is a sort of emerging uh, growth and a sense that uh, technology may provide some of the solutions that we're looking for with respect uh, to the high cost of healthcare in the US and uh, the high toll it takes on informal caregivers to provide uh, the many hours of care that they do. And these include things like telemanagement, uh, health buddy, which in involves remote monitoring, uh, information and decision support for caregivers. Uh, there's another group called Attentive Care, uh, which is an uh, internet-based system. And a lot of these are communication internet-based systems um, that uh, provide you with information, support, reminders, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, they get a little bit pricey. Uh, uh, many of them are based on monthly fee kinds of models and you're looking anywhere from 20 to $60 a month to get this service. Uh, this is a social networking kind of uh, organization. Uh, it's free, it's uh, creating private web-based communities uh, for organizing friends, family, and colleagues. Uh, people can sign up to do chores. So again, it's using the internet, the communication technology we have, to more efficiently address problems like respite care uh, that we currently have in, in the caregiving world. And I should say that in Europe, uh, this has emerged as a very powerful tool. There's sort of people signing up to help each other on the web. Uh, it turns out to be relatively effective in uh, distributing care over a large number of persons. Um, uh, Caregivers Touch is another organization. Uh, this is sort of, uh, set up for smaller groups. Uh, they provide you with contacts, calendars, journals. You, it's a place where you put your medical history, vital information, and uh, they facilitate its migration to various other platforms should you want that. Uh, these are, this is an iPhone uh, application that allows you to do GPS tracking of uh, the individual with uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there's also a lot of remote activity monitoring that's going on. Grand Care Systems is an example of that. Um, again, internet-based uh, wireless sensors require some technology and some money in order to take advantage of. And uh, again, uh, more and more remote health monitoring systems uh, that can be used to address some of the challenges that caregivers face. Now, on the whole, 
uh, you know, I have some reservations about this stuff. It's, it's sort of nibbling at the edges of what the real problems are. They aren't, uh, they're providing, I think, in many cases, valuable services. Uh, they tend to be, at this point, still too expensive and rely too much on technology in the home of the uh, caregiver. Um, but I think it's a start, and uh, to the extent that we can get some of these companies going and be successful, uh, it'll stimulate others to get into this uh, mix and we'll get into more sophisticated kinds of technology. Now, there's a, a system that we're working on right now. At, this is uh, we being the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University called First Person Vision. And what this system does, and it's being used with AD caregivers, it's a pair of glasses that have two cameras, one that, that um, gives you eye position of the user and one that sees what they see. So we call it first person vision because we see uh, what they see in their homes. So we give them these glasses in their homes. They're recording uh, those situations that they find problematic in working with the uh, individual they care for. And uh, although we haven't got there yet, uh, the uh, idea or the goal down the line is to provide them with online support so that there can be a clinician sitting back at the office who's watching what they're doing with a particular patient and correcting them or guiding them through a process of uh, delivering care in a way that is uh, uh, presumably effective. And uh, this system, uh, again, it's in very early stages of development. We do have them in the home. We're collecting the visual data and analyzing that. Uh, the instantaneous connect with the clinician has not been achieved yet, and the ultimate goal is to introduce at some point down the line uh, machine learning algorithms with, that would act, actually automatically uh, provide assistance and support, taking the, uh, uh, the clinician out of the loop with respect to providing the guidance. Okay, well, let me close uh, by making a couple of general points about the caregiving world and what it holds for us in the future. Uh, I think we are increasingly recognizing that caregiving, as family, informal caregiving, is a major public health issue in this country. And uh, the uh, SCADs of health impact data uh, have been very effective in making this point. Um, the need for informal care is going to increase dramatically as the baby boomers uh, age. Uh, and this is going to happen in a context where the constraints on formal health care services uh, are going to be uh, ever uh, more powerful. At the same time, we have this impending shortage of caregivers because uh, we have more childless parents. Uh, the baby boomers as a whole had fewer children than the generation above them. Uh, we have more women in the labor force, so, so they're less available for caregiving. Uh, we have a lot more uh, geographic dispersion of families. Uh, we have more broken families. Uh, so these are all uh, the makings of a possible perfect storm where we have this emerging incredible demand and an emerging uh, absence or decline in the availability of informal support. How that gets resolved is going to be one of the major challenges we face in the next two decades. Uh, it's very clear that Americans want to be cared for by their relatives. We've seen this in surveys over and over again. Uh, and it's also clear that people are willing to make great sacrifices to care for their relatives. So those are, uh, I think, two consonant uh, observations that uh, bode well for the future of caregiving. Uh, how can we? address some of these potential shortcomings in the future? Well, you know, we do this a little bit, but I think not enough. Uh, Americans need to be educated about their future as caregivers and care recipients. You know, we've done surveys and we ask people, what's the probability of you becoming a caregiver? And 70% of them will say, yes, it's likely it's gonna happen to me. If you ask them, what's the probability of you becoming a care recipient? About 25% say, that's gonna happen to me. So people have this biased view of their own invulnerability, vulner, invulnerability uh, and uh, that's something we need to disabuse them of. Uh, 
Families need to develop realistic plans to meet these health, health chance, uh, challenges. Uh, they need resources to help them think about, plan, and prepare for their future as caregivers. And one of the things we haven't done enough at all is look at caregiving preventively, that is prepare people for the role as opposed to uh, helping them when uh, everything has already gone to hell. Uh, we need to recognize that caregivers early and often is an integral component of the uh, healthcare system and uh, that's a point that uh, Laura made uh, a few, uh, half an hour ago or so and uh, I think technology will be increasing, increasingly important uh, with respect to addressing some of these problems, uh, although it'll be important that this technology does not isolate people because to the extent that it does, uh, people will reject it. So that's what I see in our future and I wanna thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat>